According to the Chinese calendar, 1994 is the year of the dog. But in the sport of NHRA drag racing, it will forever be known as the year of the snake. During the last 10 months, Don Trudeau, having scored wins over a span of four decades, has been saying farewell to friends and fans while on the verge of retirement. Today, at the site of his first major victory, the man with the viper-like nickname will climb into the cockpit one last time, hoping to emerge four seconds later in triumph. Also in hot pursuit of glory are a pair of teammates on the Wayne County Pro Stock team, Scott Jeffreyon and Daryl Alderman, who have dueled their identical dodges from coast to coast. With the Winston Championship going down to the proverbial wire, each contender has his vision filled by his mechanized mirror image, and everyone is watching. Welcome everyone to American Sports Cavalcade's coverage of NHRA Championship Drag Racing Competition from the Winston Select Finals at the Los Angeles County Fair Flags. The Snakes Final Strike Tour ends this weekend here in Pomona, California. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Evans and welcome to our American Sports Cavalcade coverage of the Winston Select Finals. In that Scott Coletta came to Pomona with the Top Fuel Winston Championship already in his pocket, all the attention was on this maroon car. The grandstands here in Pomona packed a capacity with partisan Prudhomme fans. He was born and raised in Southern California. But Don's hopes of going out a winner went up in tire smoke earlier today in round number one against Bob Vandegrift Jr. It's a heck of a way to have to end it, but, but it's been a thrill. It's been a joy. You know, win, lose, draw. It's the way it goes, man. You know, it's hate to smoke the tires in my final pass down the quarter mile, but... Sport's been great to me, and I just want to thank all the fans once again. It's been a fantastic time. We thank you. And the guy with the dubious distinction of being the snake killer here today in his final strike, Bob Vandegrift Jr., at least they still want your autograph. Well, that's nice. I mean, uh, it's been a long season, and I guess to go out like that, it's all worth it. You grew up in Southern California, a big snake fan like all of us. Yeah, I mean, it, he's a legend. I mean, it's quite an honor to beat him. I mean, without him, I wouldn't be here, you know. I mean, uh, he's paved the way for all of us to have the opportunity to do this, and it's quite an honor. Good luck in round two. Thank you very much. But let me tell you, the bell of the ball in top field this weekend is a bell, Shelly Anderson. As you may remember, Shelly Anderson in her Slick 50 car won the opening race of the season right here on this Pomona pavement. But what a performance yesterday in the Budweiser Top Fuel Classic. First round, 471. Second round, 474. Third round, 471 again, $50,000 from Budweiser and potentially $50,000 from Slick 50 for a new national record if it stands through the weekend. We're glad to be there. We are glad to win the $50,000 from Budweiser and hopefully we'll leave today with the $50,000 from Slick 50 for the World Record Club. Go get them. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, with the funny car story, here's Dave McClellan. Steve, the golden arches on the Oldsmobile driven by Cruz Pedragon indicate one red-hot race team, particularly the last part of the season. For four consecutive races coming into Pomona, Cruz had been in the final round and had won three of them, but it didn't do him a lot of good in the Winston points chase. John Force was the runaway winner. But Force has been having his share of problems, too, primarily with breakage. John and Paula Martin squared off in the first round here today. John had a big lead at half track when something went wrong and a big explosion ensued. He coasted across the finish line the winner, but was not a happy camper. Little smoke, but the old 302 bottles, coal fire went off there and uh, saved my old heap. So we got to go. We got to fix it. We're going to come back. And Snake knows how to do it. That's how we're going to do it. Meantime, Cruz Pedregon was able to capitalize on his late season consistency. In round number one, he defeated Whit Bazemore, improving from his qualifying time of a 5.16 to an incredible 5.08. That win advanced Cruz into round number two, where his opponent would be number three qualifier Al Hoffman, who also improved in the first round, this time to a 5-12. Now for the story in pro stock, here's Bob Fry. Dave, when the 1994 Winston drag racing season got underway here at Pomona for the Chief Auto Parts Winter Nationals, everybody hoped 
that the pro categories would give us some great excitement in close races. Well, the Dodge Camp is taking care of that. It's a great battle between Scott Jeffreyon and Darrell Alderman. The cars came into this round qualified number two and number four, which means that they can't meet until the final round. That's not good for Scott Jeffreyon. He's got to go two rounds further than Darrell if he wants to win the championship. In the first round, Darrell got off to a magnificent start as he pounded Ricky Smith in the slick 50 Pontiac with a 708. Serving noticed that he was not about to give up this championship easily. Scott Jeffrey on, on the other side of the ladder had Billy Ewing recorded a very strong 7.10 to take out the former Warren Johnson Oldsmobile and advance into round number two. You know, I find it very interesting that after a year of pro stock battles between the two Dodgers and the two Oldsmobiles, in round number two, Kurt Johnson gets to take on Darrell Alderman. And that means that all of a sudden, Scott Jeffreyon is the biggest Kurt Johnson fan here at Pomona. And Bob, I'm sure way back in the pitch, you can tell it's time for round number two of the Nitro Funny Cars, Jim Epler versus Richard Hartman. And David, this has been a tricky track for any of the Nitro cars. It has indeed, but that 508 recorded by Cruz Pedragon in round number one certainly proved that tricky it may be, but if you do have the presence of mind and the combination to get everything to work right all at the same time, you can put together a good run. Jim Epler is hoping that's gonna be the case as he comes up against Richard Hartman. Richard Hartman has been a delightful surprise here at Pomona this weekend. Johnny West owns and wrenches on the car. They've had some of their best performances of the year. Everybody wants to end the season with a bang. Not literally, just figuratively. And I'll tell you, the Rug Doctor car, Jim Epler, everybody knows the first to run 300 miles an hour. He's getting a little tired of John Forrest putting up 300s almost every time he goes down the racetrack. And Epler himself has only done it once from Vancouver, Washington. Epler qualified number four and defeated Dean Scusa in round one. Richard Hartman at the wheel of Johnny West Motorola Dodge was the number 12 qualifier with a 528. But he was one of those racers, like Cruz Pedragon, that improved on his elapsed time in round number one. He used a 523 to lay away the Winter Nationals champ, Casey Spurlock. The weather rather cool this morning. The crews uh, don't seem at all concerned about building too much heat in the motors, which produces more horsepower than maybe this pavement can handle. The drivers have a very hard time seeing the starting line for obvious reasons. The fuel injector right in front of them, uh, and the crews try to get them within a foot or so, and then they can kind of bump them in themselves. While we have not seen a lot of difference between the lanes, the choice here went to Hartman by virtue of his quicker elapsed time in his round one victory. Starter Buster Count waiting to throw the switch. Falling behind is Epler. Look at this run for Richard Hartman. Oh my, a 5.19 at 292 miles an hour. That might be the best speed ever for that car. Maybe it's best of laps time. Epler could not keep it running on eight cylinders. He slowed to a 5.59. Here comes Helen Hoffman, Al Hoffman's wife, with a gift for starter Buster Couch and a big kiss as well. Now to the far end of the track, let's go to Steve. Have you ever been to the semifinals with this car, Richard? Yeah, we kind of lucked our way into the semifinals at Brainerd this year. The other guys were smoking tires and stuff, but I think we're doing a little more on performance this race. How about a 19? Wow. This car ran its best ever mile an hour last round. Texas, it was hauling. This race, it's hauling again. We had some problems. People have been helping us. I think Chuck Warsham, he gave us a little hint that round. Appreciate it. Making progress. 519 and 292. More funny cars coming up next from Pomona. Welcome back to Pomona, California. No, that's not fog. That's tire smoke from funny car burnouts. We're still in round number two. It'll be Al Hoffman up against Cruz Pendragon in the McDonald's car. And Dave McClellan, these two have been battling each other all year. Not for the championship. John Force has got that. For the number two spot, it still pays a lot of bonus cash. And that late season charge that Cruz Pendragon put on has vaulted him ahead of Al Hoffman, who qualified number three in this race with a 513, improved to a 512 in round one. Pendragon, meantime, qualified sixth at a 516. And don't forget, that 5.08 that he ran in the first round was the quickest ET of the round, particularly when John Force had the problem. A check under the body for the crew of the Western Auto Slick 50 Dodge. Crewman bringing Pendragon into the staging beam. 
And this will be the last race for Cruz Pedregon under the ownership of Larry Miner Motorsports. Next year, that team will be owned by Joe Gibbs of football fame. Al Hoffman, he just wants to try to get that number two point spot, but I'm not sure he can do it. A lot of clutch dust in the Hoffman car. Cruz Pedregon, a sizzling 5.09 and our decent speed of 294 miles an hour. Steve, as we watch this in replay, take a look at the consistency of the McDonald's car. Pedregon whips it hard off the starting line and then just slowly but surely drives away from Al Hoffman, who recorded a respectable 518 at 290 miles an hour, but it was not near enough to catch the flying Pedregon. Drag racers use the C word a lot because it's so important, consistency, and you've got it, 09 again. That's great, Hoffman, I tell you what, he's tough. Yeah. That Western Auto car, he was right there, I heard him, I felt him, but uh, hey, we got the win, it's as nice as the hometown folks here at Pomona. We love it, we're on the next round, thank you. Pedregon thinking about round wins, and so are the next pair of drivers. This is the Dodge Avenger bodied car. The Kendall GT1 entry of Chuck Angels. His opponent is Tom Hoover, wheeling the pioneer art of entertainment Dodge Daytona. And Hoover is locked in a tight battle with Kenji Okazaki for the number 10 spot in the Winston Chase. Tom Hoover is the opposite of Cruz Pentagon. No consistency. Qualified at a 519. One of the first round with a very weak and lucky 550. Chuck Angels, ho oh, ho, number two at a 512. John Metton, his crew chief, has got this baby flying. The 518 by Angels in the first round gives him the choice of lanes, and like Richard Hartman before, and Cruz Pedregon, they have selected the lane furthest from the camera. The pressure is definitely on Hoover at this point. He needs those 200 points to come with each round win if he hopes to finish in the top 10. Chuck Edsel is one of the teams that has the luxury of testing for 1995. That's really what they're using this race for. They'd like to win it, but if they don't, they can learn something all the better. Look at this. They've learned a lot. Chuck Edsel's, whoa, 5.11 improves on his qualifying number. And a speed of only 280 tells us there's a lot left in that machine. Hoover, a nice 5.19. It just wasn't enough. Hoover may have fallen a few hundredths of a second short in the elapsed time department, but he had the big numbers on the top end running over 292 miles an hour. But races are won based upon elapsed time and not speed, and Etchell's definitely prevailed. This race was decided by just about a car length at the finish line. Etchell's the winner. Well, the numbers are getting tight. 09 for Cruz, you just ran a nice 11. Yeah, it's a real good run in you know, the heat of the day, but we knew uh, Hoover was gonna be tough. Uh, he told us beforehand uh, he needed to win that round to be in the top 10 and uh, kind of feel bad. Like Hoover a lot, but Okazaki's having a party back there. <laughs> Out on the racetrack, our final pair here in round number two. And the question mark about this race is, has John Force been able to repair the number one qualified car for the challenge of the Spoken Joe's Racing Ford Mustang, Gordy Bonin up? We already showed you the highlight of the round number one explosion. It was a boomer that put John on his knees. It took him a while to recover. In fact, he even went into the ambulance. But Bernie Federley and Austin Coyle, they've got all the bullets, all the parts they could possibly need. So unless it's a gremlin that is in some other part of the system of the car, I got a feeling that John Forrest will be just fine. Thank you. He qualified number one at a 497. Meantime, Gordy Bonin qualified ninth at a 522. Slowed to a 525 when he beat Gary Bolger in the first round. But that is more than enough to give him the lane choice over fourth. The crew, Austin Coyle, their leader, checking over the car of force. Brand new engine in that race car. And as the other racers say, Steve, every trick known to man. Absolutely. And Gordy Bonin is one of those racers that is always around to pick up the pieces. He won two national events this year and really took advantage of other people's problems. Uh, he's not the best car to have in the other lane if you're on any kind of a downslide. A big question mark here about Force. Only in the latter part of the season have we seen the Castrol GTX Chevy Lumina having any kind of problems. Bonin goes up in smoke. Look at the raw fuel pouring out of the exhaust pipes. That means it's not firing those cylinders. And John Force with a mediocre at best 536 at 256 goes into the semifinals. His opponent will be Richard Hartman. And how often do you say this? Hartman has the lane choice. The other side of the ladder, Bruce Pedregon and Chuck Etchels. And right now, Mr. Consistency, 
Pedregon gets to pick his lane. Now down to Steve. You just got a big, big break. Now you can tune this thing up. Hey, well, we're just all screwed up from that last round trying to get her together. What's really amazing is that when she don't have no power, she drives right at the wall. I lifted about 1,000 foot because, like, she's going in, it's going to crash. And I lifted, and I didn't see him. I hit it again because, oh, boy. I'm... Don't yell, John. I won't yell. <laughs> Baby, what's wrong with you? I'm sure they'll figure it out. This huge crowd just waiting to see what's coming up next, and it may be a new Pro Stock champion to be crowned. Welcome back to American Sports Cavalcade. It is Pro Stock time, round number two, and a couple of sensational drivers and automobiles here. Bob Glidden against Scott Jeffrey on. You're on board Scott Jeffrey on's Dodge Avenger. If he can beat Glidden, his title hopes are still alive. Unless, of course, in this same round, Daryl Alderman wins, then he would be the Winston champion. Scott Jeffrey on from Aliso Viejo, California, about bam, 45 minutes from the racetrack. Bob Glidden from Whiteland, Indiana. And Dave, there's something special here for him. For the first time in 22 years, Bob Glidden may not win a single race in a season. One of the more incredible strings in racing history could be coming to an end at this event. Scott Jeffreyon has definitely been the class car. He qualified quicker, ran quicker in the first round. The Dodge and the Ford, a little bit of a staging battle possibly. They're in the pre-stage beam. They are about six to eight inches away from the actual starting line. Jeffreyon's in. Glidden flickered the lights. You're riding with Scott Jeffreyon in the Dodge. The old Fox had a slight advantage on the starting line, but it's not enough. Glidden's streak of 22 years goes down. Scott Jeffreyon is still alive. 7.06 at 196 miles an hour. That is three hundredths of a second quicker than Scott Jeffreyon's qualifying time. Impressive performances indeed. Steve? With that 7.06, you are hanging on by a thread. I ran a 7.06? You got it. Man. These guys from Wayne County, how about them, huh? I might even have lane choice over WJ if he wins this round. No one in a hurry to stage up there. Well, they don't come any craftier than Bob Glidden. You know he's going to pull out all the stops. And believe me, he's taught me plenty of lessons out here. And some of them have been the best ones I've ever learned. Well, you're looking at the new generation of the Ford Quality Care Team. This is young Rusty Glidden, Bob's son. He qualified well at a 7-10. Matched that in round number one as he defeated Mark Osborne. His opponent, engine builder Steve Schmidt out of Indianapolis. Number three qualifier with a 7.08 at a 7.11 when he whipped Jerry Ekman in the first round. Well, it seems like Steve Schmidt and his company uh, built half the Pro Stock engines. In the Rusty Glidden car is a motor built by his brother Billy out of just scrap and spare parts from around the shop. They've experimented. It's no longer a Hemi head Ford. It's strictly a wedge. Let's see what happens. Rusty's been having a ball driving this car. Shouting and screaming as only he can. Oh, and Schmidt just drills Glidden off the mark. Incredible reaction time. Can Rusty catch him? Oh, oh my. That was two thousandths of a second between them. 7.15 beats a 7.10. Three runs in a row. Rusty Glidden runs 7.10, but the string runs out. When he is laid off the starting line, you could see the Dynagear Rosemobile Cutlass of Steve Schmidt get the advantage by nearly five hundredths of a second. That amount of time, some five hundredths of a second, was the advantage performance-wise that Glidden enjoyed with the Ford. But as they neared the finish line, our Copulink timing system separated the two, and two thousandths of a second, margin of victory to Schmidt. Steve the Snake Schmidt. What a whole shot that was. <laughs> well, my guys were a little concerned. He had a 413 light last round, and I told him, don't worry about it. He's just a kid. The old man can handle it. Were you gambling? No, not at all. Well, I wonder if this man might take a gamble or two. Here in round number two at the Winston Select Finals, Daryl Alderman has a lot riding on this race. How much? Possibly his third Winston championship. The pressure's been put on by his teammate. Scott Jeffrey on is keeping on the heat. Qualified number two was Alderman at a 7.04. He had 7.08 in the first round. And Kurt Johnson qualified number seven with a nice 7.11. Run 7.12 in round number one. I don't think Alderman in any way is going to gamble. As good as Kurt Johnson is, Alderman figures that Wayne Carney Adventure can outrun him. He's not going to gamble. If he wins right here, he is the new Winston champion. If he loses, Scott Jeffreyon has to win the entire event. Scott down at the far end with me, looking up track. 
intently watching to see what his teammate's going to do. One of the great camera shots in all of motorsports on board in the Mopar Dodge Avenger with Darrell Alderman. Through the five speed and Kurt Johnson slows with mechanical problems. Darrell Alderman has clinched his third Winston Championship. 708 at 194 miles an hour. And as we ride again, look at the intensity on Alderman's face. Kurt Johnson disappears from sight. Alderman's just got to get it through the finish line, and he did. The win to Alderman, and a third Winston title resides on his mantle. Maybe now you can get a good night's sleep and quit worrying about this thing. Yeah, I know. It's been a tough weekend. Uh, of course, I don't know if it's mathematically over with yet or not, but... Uh, They're saying it is. Well... I'll take it. <laughs> While Alderman begins his celebration, Austin Coyle and crew are thrashing on John Force's Chevy Lumina, trying to find the problem. Can they do it? Welcome back to American Sports Cavalcade. We're in Pomona, California at the Winston Select Finals. I'm Steve Evans along with Dave McClellan and Bob Fry. We have talked so much about the dominating Dodges. Let's not forget for 95, we better watch that man. Warren Johnson, he qualified number one here at a 704. As Buddy Baker one time said about Dale Earnhardt, don't tug on Superman's cape. Well, Warren Johnson and his GM performance parts, Oldsmobile had a 704 to lead the 16 car field in the first round of eliminations where he beat Chuck Harris while Jim Yates qualified number nine with a 7-11 and beat Mark Powick in the first round. And this is worth going back and taking a look at once again. The Pontiac, the Dynamax car was in the near lane. The Summit Racing Oldsmobile driven by Powick in the far lane. This was one of the closest drag races you will ever witness. One less than one thousandth of a second less than three inches separated the two cars at the finish line as a whole shot advantage by the Dynamax car and Jim Yates won it. Let's see if Yates can do it again. Oh, and he does. Another brilliant driving job by Jim Yates in the far lane, the Pontiac ahead of the Oldsmobile. It is Warren Johnson at 7.08 to Yates is 7.14, but Johnson shoot is out, Yates is not. Down the racetrack, Jim Yates trying to get the car under control. The shoot comes out at the last moment, but too late. Into the hay bales at the end of the racetrack. You see the nose crumple. The door comes open as Jim Yates opens it up under his own power. Yates had the advantage off the starting line, not because he was so quick. Warren Johnson was very slow, a 4.5 to a 5.0 reaction time, 4.0 being perfect. As they made their way down the racetrack, it was Johnson clawing his way back into contention. The margin of victory, as we told you, only two thousandths of a second at the finish line. The margin in performance was exactly six hundredths of a second going to Johnson. It was in the shutdown area that Yates' problems magnified themselves. The parachute late coming out, and that may have led Yates to avoid the sand trap. It's designed to slow a car down. As you can see, the parachute and brake combination didn't do much for Yates. Behind that stack of hay bales is a big steel pole that supports the catch net at the end of the sand trap. Let's go to Steve. I believe we have had us a shunt, as they say in road racing down here. Oh, it wasn't a good show, was it? We what just, happened? Uh, well, I, I guess uh, we were going through the, pair, the finish line, and I didn't get the parachute out till late, and it took a while to hit. And I uh, was just... I just thought I had a lot more room than that, and by the time I got tried to drive around the, tried to drive around the sand trap, and that wasn't a thing to do. Wife Tony comes up, gives Jim a hug. Well, if this upsets her, it's a good thing she didn't marry a funny car driver. Hmm? As Jim and Tony Yates uh, commiserate with their problems, he's okay. The car is repairable, and our final four has been set. Scott Jeffrey on and Warren Johnson with Scott holding the lane choice. The other side of the ladder, the new Winston champion, Daryl Alderman against Steve Schmidt, and Daryl gets to pick his lane. We have semi-finalists in two of our three pro categories. Here's the last, and this is round number two of Top Fuel Eliminator. The American International Airways car, driven by Connie Coletta. His competition is Blaine Johnson in the Travers Tool Company car. No one has had more fun this year than Connie Galata. He watched his son Scott win a Winston Championship, and he won a few races on his own, including the U.S. Nationals. 
It is a minor miracle that Blaine Johnson is even on the starting line to race Connie Coletta because in round number one, it was Johnson up against Stevie Foster. Foster in the near lane, but watch the car in the far lane. Foster red lights anyway by a mile. Blaine Johnson, four-time alcohol champion, has his first really serious top fuel engine explosion, and some shrapnel takes that tire off it. Now he knows what it's like to drive a tricycle. Bringing the car to a safe stop, he was able to keep it upright, the damage minimal to the chassis, and they were able to thrash between rounds, not only putting in a new motor, but replacing all of the wiring and tubing necessary to run a modern-day nitro-burning engine. Johnson had run well, though. He had qualified number two at a great 475, had that 538, as you saw with the engine explosion in the first round. Kanye Galetta, look at that smile. He qualified number seven at 480, ran a 503, got a little lucky over Michael Brotherton in round one. But right now, we're going to find out exactly what Blaine Johnson and his crew are made out of. By the way, that's the only Coletta you're going to see in this show because the newly crowned champ, Scott, smoked the tires in round number one. The first big pit crash for Alan Johnson, crew chief for his brother Blaine. How well have they done it? Staging at a dead idle, as all of the nitro cars do. They just stand on the gas. There's no clutch to let out. It's all centrifugal. Looking good. Great side-by-side -side race decided by just a couple of feet as Connie Coletta prevails. A 484 at 293 miles an hour. Looks like a bit of oil smoke coming out of the engine. Blaine Johnson had a 487 at 297. So Alan Johnson and crew deserve a tremendous amount of credit getting this car not only competitive, but on the verge of winning the race. As you can see in the replay, it was Connie. Their uh, cylinder drop failed to fire, and Blaine almost caught him at the finish line. Steve? Connie's down here just laughing. Somebody's got to hold up the Coletta name. <laughs> We're working at it. That was a good drag race. Yes, it was. It was real close. I looked over, and I, I, he was right there, and I maybe about a wheel in front of him. See in the semis. Thank you. Back at the starting line, that's Shelly Anderson. She's the new national record holder. Her dad, Brad, using some racer tape, trying to take the glare of the sun out of Shelly's eyes. We are back at the monstrous facility known as the L.A. County Fairplex, and that is Shelly Anderson for the first time in her top fuel career, the number one qualifier. She'll be up against Mike Dunn, and if Dunn can beat Shelly and run quicker than a 471, who knows, he might take the $50,000. She set the record, but has to leave here with it. Mike Dunn, well, he qualified number eight at a 481. He ran a 518 in round one. Eddie Hill smoked the tires. Shelly, after her 471 in qualifying, ran a 490 to beat Scott Coletta, the newly crowned champ in round one. She got lucky on that one. Yes, she did, as uh, maybe a lot of racers taking that first round a little bit too cautiously. Those that prevailed seemed to be the ones that were the most aggressive. We just saw Brad Anderson, Chili's dad, walk away, but a lot of the credit for the performance of this car is going to new crew chief Ray Alley, the computer wizard. Tremendous start. And Mike Dunn, by just a matter of inches, wins it, and his crew chief, Frank Bradley, has got to be thrilled. 304.87 miles an hour at a 479. And as we watch this one again in replay, Shelly Anderson matches it second for second down the racetrack. But she could not hold off that strong top end charge. She ran 479 as well, but her speed only 296 miles an hour. The crew chief that has now put four racers in the 300 mile an hour zone, Bradley, has to be thrilled with Mike's performance. They don't get a lot better or a lot closer than that. Whew, I knew she was right there. Uh, <laughs> that car's been running good all, all weekend long, and we knew we were going to have to step up before we had a little bit of problem first round, but luckily this La Victoria team, uh, we were able to come back and get the win. Next pair of cars, the guy that has the distinction of defeating Don Prudhomme on the Snake's last pass as a driver down the quarter mile. Bob Vandergriff Jr. sits at the wheel of the Fruit of the Loom car. He qualified 13th with a fine 486. His opponent, the McDonald's dragster, Corey Mack, qualified 5th at a 479, then slowed to a 483 in the first round when he beat Pat Austin. And you know, Mac, it wasn't so much that Bob Vandegrift Jr. beat Don Prudhomme in round number one. 
as the snake told us earlier in the show. He really beat himself when he smoked the tires. But let me tell you what, the moment after that, as they brought Don Prudhomme up the Pomona quarter mile was just astounding. Just wonderful. I was running along with this camera shot on a golf cart. I've never seen a standing O like that one. A huge crowd jammed into the Fairflex and everyone on their feet offering their thanks to Don Prudhomme for over 30 years of a spectacular career. Good lead by Corey Mack. Corey Mack's got it in hand at a 489, which is slow for that card. Usually runs 479. Vandegrift way off base at five flat. Neither had a lot of speed, 293 miles an hour. Both the racers losing fire in cylinders as they made their way down the racetrack. Tommy Johnson Jr., the Mopar Express Loop car, is up against Kenny Bernstein. Bernstein at the wheel of the Budweiser King, coming on strong in the last half of the season to the far end and Steve. In this field today, a 489 is not going to make Corey Mack smile. No, you're right, it's not. She was laying down. I figured for sure any minute Bobby was going to come by here. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you, this kid, Bobby, come here a second. This kid's done an unbelievable job for a rookie. He did a fine job, and he knows how to handle a race car real well. But I'll tell you, the McDonald's team can't be more happy for us, and I just want to go to the final again. They need more speed. 293 says maybe the supercharger. Well, the driver knew that the performance not quite what he had hoped for. Wendy Johnson, that is Tommy's sister, backing him up after his long burnout. This is a family operation with support from Mopar. Tommy Johnson Sr. is dead, looking on. DJ qualified sixth at a 480, at a 483 in the first round. And Kenny Bernstein likes to call himself the king of speed. Well, he has the credentials after qualifying at 307 miles an hour, the fastest speed ever here at Pomona Raceway. And just because Bernstein ran 307, don't count out Tommy Johnson Jr. Look at him as he brings his visor down and the intensity in his eyes as the sun shining almost directly into his helmet. Makes it tough to see the tree. They both smoke the tires. And look at TJ fight that car being buffeted around. You think it's easy to drive one of these cars? Ha oh, ha, oh, try it sometime. Bernstein, doesn't matter what the duffer speed is. Both of them didn't run very quick, but what an interesting race to watch. And what a shock to watch them both smoke the tires after we watched two cars go down right before them, and both of them ran 479. Now here we see up in smoke Bernstein same hidden in that smoke cloud is Tommy Johnson Jr. who is way out of shape that's what you saw a moment ago as our onboard camera saw him fighting the wheel Bernstein recovers gets the traction back and takes the win at a sub bar 573 I don't know if it's the car or the driver but nobody beats Kenny Bernstein in a battle of tire smokers great thank you Steve I don't know either it just Kept me straight that time, so when you pedaled it and got back in it easy, it kept going straight. Sometimes it's got you crooked and there's nothing you can do about it. That's a lucky one. You saw what happens when you get crooked. Tommy Johnson Jr. had to fight his way out of it. Bernstein stayed straight. He was able to take the win and move to the semifinals, where he'll come up against Connie Coletta, who holds the lane choice. It is Corey Mack and Mike Dunn going to battle it out in just a few moments. Mike Dunn, surprisingly, holds the choice of lanes in that match. And over the funny car pits, there is Bob Brandt, the man who has turned around the McDonald's funny car operation, gained his initial fame in the 70s with Don Perdome, led him to four straight Winston funny car titles. A very quiet, very professional operation. They'll need all their skills if they're going to beat Chuck Edgels and his crew, led by John Medlin. And Edgels announced this weekend, next year, Tim Richards and Kim LaHaye join Medlin. Could be a force to reckon with. 